Hello there, everyone. My name's Andrew. And I'm Cassie. And this is the Culips English Podcast. Welcome back to another Simplified Speech episode, everyone. This is the Culip series that helps you to improve your English through listening to interesting, natural, and easy to understand conversations. I'm your host, Andrew, and joining me today is my co host, Cassie. Hey there, Cassie. Hey, Andrew, and hello, listeners. We're excited to be here today and to talk about a topic that was suggested to us through our Discord server by a listener named Roger. Roger asked us to talk about the different regions. Of the United States. Yeah, that's right, Cassie. And this is perfect because you're an American, so you're a great person to help us with this topic. I can try my best too, but of course, I'm a Canadian, so I don't know as much as you do, Cassie. So I think you'll be the expert for today. Maybe you can take the lead and I'll try my best to fill in the gaps. So that's our topic for today, and we'll talk about the different regions of the USA and some of their special characteristics, what makes them unique. But before we get into that conversation, I want to remind all of our listeners about the study guides and the study materials that we have available for you. So, guys, we create study guides and transcripts for all of our episodes, and they're carefully written by our team of expert English teachers. To help you make the most out of your time with Culips. And in the study guide for this episode, you'll learn about the useful and important vocabulary that you'll hear Cassie and I use today. Plus, there's a quiz and discussion and diary writing questions too. And in addition to the study guides, if you become a Culips member at our website, culips.com, you'll get even more benefits and bonuses. Like exclusive access to our member only live streams and our member only fluency files series. So, to find out all of the details and to become a member, just visit qlips.com. We'd also like to give a shout out to Farid, who left us a wonderful review on Castbox. Farid wrote With these wonderful podcasts of the Qlips team, I improve my English in a short time. Thanks a million and greetings from Azerbaijan. All right, Farid, thank you so much for that wonderful review. And to all of the listeners out there who are supporting the work that we do here at Culips by leaving us a five star rating and a nice review on your favorite podcast app. I guess Farid is a Castbox user, but you could also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or really whatever app you like the best. So thanks again, Farid, for that awesome review. And now let's get started with our talk, Cassie, about the different regions of the USA. And when I think of the USA, it's really hard to just come up with one image in mind of it because it's such a big, diverse country. It's big in terms of population, but it's also big in terms of area and landmass, right? It's just a massive, massive country. Little bit smaller than Canada, but still a massive, massive country. And so I thought we could go through each area, region by region, and just talk about some of the unique things about that area, Cassie. Now, technically, I guess most Americans, and you can correct me on this if I'm wrong, but most Americans divide the USA into about how many? Maybe six to eight. Different regions, depending on how you want to organize things. Is that correct? Yeah. Actually, for listeners who don't know, Andrew has compiled a list of different regions already, and I was reading through them, and I agree with most of them, but some of them I would even separate further. For example, Andrew wrote here the first region is called the Northeast, where he included New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maine, but I would not. Pair a lot of those together. I would call the northeastern states the more tippy top ones. Strictly Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, Connecticut, places like that. But I would consider New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and New York more of the mid Atlantic states, which are, have their own separate category. Okay. 
So why don't we start in that area of the USA then, and then we'll work our way toward the West. We'll start in the East and go West because Cassie, you're from that area of the country. So I think you probably know that pretty well. So we'll start then with the Northeast, like those states that you mentioned that are really close to Canada, Vermont, Maine. What are the other ones you mentioned there? Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Hampshire, Rhode Island. That's the tiniest one. Rhode Island is so tiny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a tiny little state. So what can you tell us about that Northeast area of the country? What's it like? Have you ever visited there before? Maybe we should start with that question. Yeah, I have. My aunt went to Yale University, pretty famous, in Connecticut. And then my sister lived in Boston for a while. So I've been up in that region quite a bit. And what are the characteristics? The people there are nice and the food is really good. It's different from what you'd find in other parts of the country. You see a lot of seafood because you're on the coast, but you're not going to eat the seafood you might see more further south. You'd eat, you know, soups maybe or lobster or things that are warmer, essentially, because it's colder weather. You want to eat warmer food. <laughs> I think of clam chowder. Yeah, that's a famous one. Clam chowder. And also that area of the USA is pretty famous for having really good craft beer, especially Vermont. I remember when I lived in Montreal, some of my friends would road trip down to Vermont just to take advantage of the craft beer there. So apparently it has a very good reputation. And like you said, Cassie, it's also a colder area of the country, right? The winters are pretty nasty in that neck of the woods. You can get some really strong winter storms. I also have the stereotype. Of course, we're going to be talking a lot about stereotypes in this episode. So the stereotype for me is that it's not as diverse. It's a little bit waspy, a little bit more white and maybe affluent. Like I know that area of the country is where a lot of rich people go to vacation in the summer. Martha's Vineyard, is that around there? That kind of place? It is. But I think there's some really beautiful mountain areas there. So a lot of people will go to go camping or glamping. And then a lot of the Ivy Leagues are also situated in this part of the country, where for those of you who don't know, Ivy Leagues are the very coveted top of the top tier universities in the States. Exactly. So it does have that reputation of being a little bit affluent, right? However, there's also the rougher parts of the cities, especially Boston. Boston is famous for having its rougher areas and very strong accents. That's what I wanted to, to mention as well, are the strong accents. If anybody knows about Mark Wahlberg, the famous actor, he has such a strong and iconic Boston accent. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a little bit of the Boston accent, Cassie? Can you do it? <laughs> I'm not great at accents, but we want to say words that don't use the R's. So instead of saying car, you'd say ka. So where's my car keys? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not so great at the accent. No, Cassie, that's a pretty good accent. I think that sounds good to my Canadian ears, at least. Anyways, why don't we move to the next region and we'll go a little down the map towards the south. And you called that the North Atlantic region. What did you call that area? The Mid-Atlantic. Sorry, Mid-Atlantic region. And that's a really, really highly densely populated area of the USA, right? We have New York, New York City, the biggest city in the country, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. What else is around there? My geography is not great, guys. I haven't taken it since <laughs> elementary school. But I'm pretty sure you can include Maryland, which has Washington, D.C. as well, our capital. Yeah, of course. So what are some of the characteristics of this part of the country. Also a big historical area because Philadelphia, Pennsylvania actually used to be the capital of the United States, but we moved it more south because the southern states were angry that it was so far north. So we had to bring it down a bit. But yeah, we have a lot of historical areas, especially in New York and Pennsylvania. Food, so good. Philly cheesesteaks, New York style pizza, New Jersey cheesecakes, bagels. 
Yeah, you can find lots of good food in this area.、Mm -hmm. And of course, New York City, especially, is maybe the city that really stands out compared to the rest. But I don't know. That area is so urbanized and so built up that it's almost like one big city. Really, when you look at it on the map, at least, it just looks like it's one huge city. You know, it's so developed in that part of the country. So I think you have a lot of diverse populations, right? Multiculturalism, a lot of different languages, a lot of different accents. And New York, especially, used to have a lot of varied accents. I don't hear them as much anymore. You know, when you hear older New Yorkers talk, sometimes you can hear those really strong, unique regional accents. But when I hear younger people talk, it's not as strong anymore, which is unfortunate. Yeah, one of my favorite New York accents comes from a SpongeBob episode where they're selling chocolate, but they say chocolate. I love chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> nice. I like it. This area of the country is also probably some of the most diverse because, like you said, New York City is uber diverse. But we also have huge populations from Puerto Rico that move here because if citizens from Puerto Rico move to the United States, they get citizenship automatically, so they can vote. Since a lot of their family members from the past moved to this region, it grows every year. We also have a lot of people who moved from the Middle East, maybe or Egypt, in this area. It's a very big melting pot in this part of the country. I think that's because you know New York used to be the starting point to head out to the rest of the country. So a lot of the immigrant population started here and then spread out. So we're the central zone.、Mm -hmm. I watched the movie The Godfather not too long ago. And was it The Godfather? Or maybe there's The Godfather too. I watched them both, and you can see early New York in that movie, and you see a lot of different people immigrate there, and they actually show the family coming from Italy to New York, and yeah, it's really cool to see. Like back then, there were you know lots of Irish immigrants, Italian immigrants from other parts of Europe, and all different sorts of countries. So yeah, huge immigrant populations, both. New and historical in that area, really cool, and it makes for a very diverse place, right? Yeah, that's actually why my family ended up in Pennsylvania. My great great grandfather was from Yugoslavia, and he moved to the states to follow his brother to Colorado. However, he got to Pennsylvania and ran out of money. <laughs> And so he started working in the coal mines. Pennsylvania was really famous for coal mines back in the day, and so a lot of immigrants moved to that area to work in the mines. Interesting. Okay. Well, Cassie, where should we go next? If we're gonna keep going down the eastern coast, then what's what's next? We have like the Virginias, the Carolinas, the Carolinas. Yeah. It would be nice if we had a picture of the American map in front of us, wouldn't it? <laughs> we wouldn't have to go from memory. Yeah, as we go down the coast, we just pass all the really cool beaches that people like to go to in the summer. Virginia Beach, the Outer Banks is a really popular beach that my family and a bunch of people go to every year. We've got yeah Georgia, and then all the way down into Florida, where you could go to Disney World or the Florida Keys or the Everglades. All very famous travel destinations.、Mm -hmm. And would you kind of lump those states together in the Southeast? States like Florida and Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi. I think they you could kind of group those together as a distinct. Region of the states. Would you agree with that? Yeah, honestly, the South is probably the region that is lumped together the most. We would even include states further inland, like Tennessee and Kentucky and Arkansas, in that group as well.、Mm -hmm. The South, yeah. And what can you tell us about the South? What are some of the characteristics about the people, or the weather, or the cuisine? Um, the South is much warmer, and it's a lot slower. In the North, we all like to talk fast and move fast and be busy, busy, busy. But in the South, you know, you slow down, you relax, you play your guitar, 
The food style is also very different. There's a lot more barbecues and fried food is really popular. Louisiana is so famous for food because Louisiana was first owned by the French. So there's a lot of French influence in that area in terms of music and culture and food, which is really cool. Well, Cassie, I should say it was first owned by the indigenous people who were there but then the french came much later first first taken over by the french yeah uh, always that dark history in north america isn't it but yes we'll save that conversation for a different episode so yeah i mean i haven't been to the south in the states it's on my bucket list i would love to do a road trip through the southern states i've heard lots of good things about New Orleans, I'd love to go there one day. Also, you know, Nashville in Tennessee, country music. I've always wanted to go to Graceland where Elvis lived and just like check out that area. I don't know. So I've always wanted to go there. Yeah, like you said, the stereotype of the people, at least, is that it's kind of laid back, a little easier. Even the speaking seems a little bit slower. I'm not sure if that's actually true or just a stereotype, but that's kind of what a lot of people think it's definitely true my sister in elementary school she had a classmate move from the south to the north and even though he was born and raised in america he spoke english his whole life he had to take a couple of days to get used to our speaking speed he didn't know what we were saying which is hilarious (laughs) and there is a negative stereotype of people from the South as being maybe perhaps not as highly educated as Northerners. And again, I don't think that's really true. There's been some really smart people from the South, like Bill Clinton's from Arkansas, right? He was a Rhodes Scholar and a two-term president of the state. So definitely that's just a stereotype. But there is that kind of feeling sometimes that people from the South are just not the same as northerners but yeah of course that's just a stereotype yeah i think it's maybe because of the euphemisms they use the southerners have such cool phrases and slang terms that we don't use in the north and maybe because of that it's considered more i don't know crash but uh it's just a different way of talking yeah i agree lots of different varieties of english and I mean, we can debate about what is proper grammar and improper grammar, but at the end of the day, if you're communicating a message and the other person understands it, then the grammar works. So yeah, maybe that's something we could talk about in a future Culips episode is the different accents and different dialects of American English. And maybe we could find some people to help us out with that as well. But we'll save that for another episode because if we go into that now, we'll be here for hours and hours. We want to keep things Moving along, so what is the next area of the country we should talk about, Cassie? The next area is unfortunately the most overlooked, kind of considered the most boring, and that is the Midwest. (laughs) (laughs) The Midwest, okay. So the Midwest I have been through. I did a road trip through the Midwest once, and... Ah, poor Andrew. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, I actually loved it because I, I stopped in Chicago for a couple of days and Chicago is an amazing city. And I also went to the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And those are two cities that are very close together to each other. So they're often called the Twin Cities, but really it's Minneapolis and St. Paul. And I thought they were awesome. I really enjoyed going to both of those places, Chicago and the Twin Cities, and just generally that area. I didn't really like Indiana, though. I remember Indiana as being nothing special. But the Midwest is that area in kind of the middle northern part of the USA. So states like Illinois and Ohio, Michigan, Iowa, Indiana, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Missouri. Yeah, all of those areas. So Cassie, you said that it's not so great in the Midwest. Why why do you not like the Midwest? No, it's not that I don't like it. It's just I think the big culture hubs are in the east and the west and maybe the Rocky Mountains slightly more in between the Midwest and the west because those are where the mountains are. It's where the cool geographical features are. The Midwest is pretty much just 
flat cornfields for miles and miles and miles. <laughs> but the cities, you're right, are very cool. Chicago has some of the coolest architectural designs, the coolest artwork that you can find, the food also awesome. But in the surrounding areas, there's a lot of cows, corn, and pigs. Yeah, I'm going to push back a little bit here, Cassie, because there are the Great Lakes in the Midwest. So it's not just all farm. There are these amazing lakes, which are huge lakes, guys. If you haven't seen the Great Lakes before, then your mind will be blown when you see them because they are huge. They're almost like oceans in the middle of the North American continent here. So there is some variety and also, I think there's a lot of great culture, too, in cities like Chicago and Detroit with different styles of music originating from those areas. And Cassie, I have to ask you, what do you think about Chicago deep dish pizza? Is it overrated or underrated? I think it's a good thing to try once, but I would definitely prefer the thinner New York style pizza. How about you? I completely agree with you. Overrated. I waited in line for a long time at a famous Chicago deep dish pizza restaurant, and I was really disappointed. I thought it was too big, too heavy, too greasy, and wasn't my style, even though I love pizza. So, yeah. Yeah. There is one thing. So you mentioned some cool stuff already, but the Midwest is also famous for one, really friendly people, and two, county fairs. If anybody can put on a good fair, it is the Midwest. Exactly. Yeah. I haven't been to any of the fairs there, but I imagine with all of the farmland that's around that area that there would be some really great state fairs probably in the fall, right? They usually happen in the fall. Yeah. In the fall, maybe even in the early summer. I'm not sure. The best ones are in the fall, of course. But you can have so many cool different kinds of foods. You can see animals, you can see horse shows, you can ride kind of sketchy carnival rides. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> I always like going to, well, in Canada, we just call it the, the fall fair because we don't have any states. So the fall fair, but in my province, we also had the PNE, the Pacific National Exhibition. And yeah, super fun. I love going to those kind of fall fairs and Cassie, I don't know about what your favorite thing to do is, but mine is to go and look at all of the different vegetables. People grow the vegetables and then they compete. They'll be like, oh, I grew a pumpkin that's 200 pounds. And then somebody else will be like, oh, yeah, I have a 250 pound pumpkin. And then they actually have judges that come around and give medals to the pumpkins or ribbons, right? Like you'll see, oh, this one has a blue ribbon. It's the best pumpkin this year. Or this one has a second place ribbon. I don't know. It's really fun. And they do that for all different sorts of vegetables. You'll see somebody like, this guy grew the best onions this year. He's the blue ribbon <laughs> for the onions. It's really funny. They grew a carrot the size of my arm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I love that kind of thing. That's great. What about the next region? Where should we move to next? There's only a few left. I think the next region, if we're moving further west, honestly, I don't know what we'd call it, but you could lump some of them into other regions. But in my opinion, I like to call the whole border along the Rocky Mountains like its own region. So you could start up in the north in Montana and go all the way down to New Mexico, honestly. And all of those states in between, you have Colorado, you have Arizona, you have Nevada with the Grand Canyon. I would lump those all in their own little line from tippy top of the U.S. to the south. Yeah, I mean, this is getting closer to where I'm more comfortable talking about the USA because I've visited the West more than any other region. So for me, it's like in terms of Western United States, you have the Pacific Northwest which is like Washington State and maybe Oregon and Northern California, that area. And then you have California. It's kind of a thing of its own. And then you have the Rocky Mountain states. So Colorado, maybe Montana, Utah. Those are really like nature heavy states, you know, lots of amazing natural beauty in those areas. And then you have like the Southwest so maybe New Mexico, Arizona, those states, and Texas even, 
Although Texas is another state, which is kind of its own place, right? Just like California. We lump it in with the South, but honestly, it could be its own country. It's so right. big. Well, I think many Texans sort of think of it as being its own republic, right? Isn't it the Republic of Texas? Yeah, they tried to secede from the U.S. at one point. Right, but there is that strong independent streak to Texans. Okay, so why don't we break down these different western areas really quick. We'll start with the Pacific Northwest, because that's the area that I've visited the most. Washington State, amazing, beautiful place. Seattle is the biggest city in Washington State. And the home of grunge music. It's really famous for rainy weather and for coffee. Starbucks first opened their first cafe in Seattle. And also has, you know, a lot of great seafood because it's close to the Pacific Ocean. There's great craft beer as well. It's another place that's really popular for that. And also kind of a laid back, I don't want to say hippie, but more open minded population. I think there are a lot of artists there, a lot of musicians there, maybe, yeah, more artsy fartsy than other areas of the country, I would think. Yeah, that's right. I've also been to this area a bunch because my aunt and my sister live in Oregon, directly below Washington. And Oregon is just an absolutely amazing state. It has all of the biomes you can imagine. It has, you know, the beach, which on the Pacific coast. And then it also has the city of Portland, Oregon, which had its own TV show. It was such a cool, wacky city. Portlandia. Yep. It also has some temperate forests with lots of cool mountains that you can hike in. But on the west, it also has a desert region. So you could literally be in the city at one point, drive three hours south to go hiking in these huge mountain ranges, and then drive three hours east and be in the desert with cacti and tumbleweeds blowing past. <laughs> yeah, it's an awesome area of the country. I love Oregon and Washington. Washington's the same way. If you go towards eastern Washington, it's very deserty as well. It's really cool. California, we should talk about California quickly. I think maybe a lot of our listeners will be most familiar with California, right? Los Angeles, Hollywood, movie stars, surfers, laid back culture, fast food. <laughs> That's what comes to mind, like famous hamburger restaurants. What else do you think of when you think of California, Cassie? Honestly, I hear a lot of people say like, oh, I want to travel to the States and I want to go to LA. And yeah. Don't get me wrong, LA is a cool place, but it wouldn't be the place I recommend if I was going to California. I would go to San Francisco, which has just as much cool culture, but you don't have to drive around as much. You could actually take public transport. Or I would get out of the cities and go to the national parks. California has some of the most beautiful national parks in the world. I got to travel them with my grandmother a few years ago, and I had the best time. Awesome. Unfortunately, I've never been to California. It's really frustrating for me because it's one of those things like, you know, I lived pretty close to California for my whole life. You could fly down there in just two hours or so, or, you know, drive down there in less than a day. And it's one of those things that you take for granted. You're like, yeah, I'll go there someday. Of course, I'm going to go one day. And then I moved to Korea, and now it's really far away and very difficult to visit. So ah, it's one of those regrets that I have growing up is that I never visited, but definitely on the to-do list. Yeah, I think the hardest part for you too, Andrew, is to do with your break schedule around school. The best time to visit California is in what we call the shoulder seasons, which is not the peak winter Christmas time season or the peak summertime season. It's those shoulders when the weather is more mild in maybe late spring or early fall. And the reason is, is because California is a pretty hot place. But some of the best national parks in California are the desert regions. And if you try to go there in the summer, you'll melt. It's so hot. But if you could go maybe in September and October, it will be amazing. I recommend it to anyone, especially Death Valley. Death Valley is the area of the States that 
is closest to sea level and it's the hottest place that you can find in North America. I would love to go on a road trip through California and into Nevada and into the desert one day. So maybe we should talk about that southwest area, you know, getting into Nevada. We're getting closer to Arizona, to New Mexico. Of course, Las Vegas is in Nevada, right? And it is very dry and desert-like. Have you visited that area of the country before, Cassie? My best friend actually just moved out there to Arizona. And I've only been there for 10 hours. <laughs> I was flying from Pennsylvania to Oregon to meet my family, but I had a 10-hour layover in Arizona. And we decided to leave the airport because who wants to sit in the airport for 10 hours, right? And I will say it was summer and we only had 10 hours, but the surrounding area outside the airport for miles and miles and miles was literally nothing but desert and strip malls. I think the Southwest is a bit of the last wild frontier of the States. It's probably the least developed while not being, you know, super elevated in the mountains. It's the least developed flat part of America. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. I would love to check it out too. I mean, I want to check out all of the areas of the States that I haven't visited yet, but that area seems really interesting to me. Let's talk now quickly about Texas. What can you say about Texas? When I think about Texas, I think about boisterous, confident people. I think about the growing tech community in the cities. I think about cowboys and lots of food and the American dream. Yeah, Cassie, it's interesting that Texas is starting to become a little bit of a tech hub now. I think it was Tesla, is it? Tesla company moved from California to Texas, I believe. So yeah, there's a kind of growing tech scene in Texas as well. And I've heard there's a lot of cool places to visit there. But yeah, I don't want to keep repeating myself too much. <laughs> it's on the list. I got to visit and check it out for myself sometime. Andrew, but before we finish this episode, though, there are two more tiny places we have to talk about, which they're not on the mainland, but we can't have a U.S. episode without talking about Alaska and Hawaii. Yeah, Alaska and Hawaii as well. This really shows the variety of different landscapes in the USA. So why don't we start with Hawaii? I've been there. Have you been to Hawaii, Cassie? I have, yes, on a vacation. Ah, I thought maybe that would be the one place that I had visited that you hadn't. Hawaii is awesome, right? Just an amazing, amazing place. Yes, this is also a travel tip. You do not need to have copious amounts of money. When I went, I went with my sister and my aunt, and we did not stay at hotels. We camped. There are some really cool campgrounds that you can rent for $20 a night that include showers and bathrooms and running water. And yeah, totally affordable. The weather is beautiful in January. So <laughs> camping is definitely an option. Yeah. And I don't know what else we have to say about Hawaii. Just this beautiful tropical lush island in the middle of the Pacific there. And yeah, I don't think we need to describe Hawaii. Everybody will know about it already. And if you get a chance to visit listeners, definitely check that out. And then Alaska is up there by itself, close to Canada. And perhaps it's the most sparsely populated state. I'd take a guess that it probably is because it's so big and so cold. So what do you know about Alaska? I think Alaska is probably similar to a lot of places in Canada. It could be very remote. You might have areas where you only have one school in that town or village. And there's a lot of places in Alaska where you don't want to go alone because you might die in the wilderness. But it has some of the most beautiful hiking areas. And I heard that the communities are really tight there. Like if you somehow had to move there someday and you worried about moving there alone without any connections, I think you could make a fresh start in that area and find some close and deep relationships with your neighbors in Alaska. Yeah, I think of Alaska as being a very wild place, lots of forests, lots of snow, lots of ice. It's a place where there's a lot of natural resource-based economies, so like mining, forestry, 
maybe hunting and fishing, all of those kinds of activities make up a lot of the local economy, I think. And pretty similar to northern Canada in many ways, I think there are probably a lot of similarities between the two places. But although I've been to northern Canada, I haven't been to Alaska, so I can't quite make that connection. But when I think of Alaska, I think, you know, if I were to go there, I'd feel pretty much at home because it seems to be very, very similar to a lot of the northern areas of Canada as well. Okay, well, Cassie, thank you so much for your hard work during this episode. That was great to learn all about the different regions of the USA, and I hope we did it justice. Of course, your country is so big, so diverse. There are 50 different states, and it's really hard to talk about the whole culture and the whole special characteristics of a whole country in just a short episode here. But I hope that our listeners found it interesting and helpful for understanding more about the United States of America. So I think that will bring us to the end of this episode, but actually we're gonna keep going just for a little bit longer in the bonus content that is available for our member community, just as a way to say thank you to all of our members who support us. So you can find that extra bonus content in the ad-free version of this episode that is available to all QLoops members by logging into our website and going to the dashboard. And if you haven't already, consider becoming a QLoops member to get access to our study guides, interactive transcripts, ad-free audio, and other fun bonuses. And at the same time, you would be supporting the work we do and allowing us to keep making new English lessons for you each and every week. You can also show your support by following us on Instagram or YouTube, recommending QLips to your friends who are learning English, or by leaving us a five-star rating and a positive review on your favorite podcast app. And then, of course, we're also on Discord, so you can join our Discord community as well. Anyways, guys, that's it for us for now. So take care, and we'll talk to you next time. See ya.